Welcome back with a smiling face. Links to previous episodes are given in the video description, so don't forget to like, subscribe and share the video. The Edge of Tomorrow Episode 16 Chapter 119 I turned on my heel, a hand clasped over where my own bullet wound should have been. My mind was reeling, but my body understood what to do as I stumbled over to where Cade lay on the cement floor. Alec was hunched over him tearing the clothes from one of the inner circle members, a middle-aged man with graying hair and a scar. The thousand-dollar suit jacket was shining with Cade's blood, even as Alec held it tightly against his chest. I could feel the blood pumping out with each ragged heartbeat. A small clump of silver metal sat beside Alec's knelt form, the bullet he had fished from Cade's chest. Cade shifted into his human form after the bullet had been removed, his skin translucent and pale. There was a thin sheen of sweat that covered him, even though he was cold to the touch. Alec's eyes met mine, unending darkness that seemed surprisingly calm despite the earthquake of emotions shattering what strength he had. I glanced around the room, the taste and scent of fresh blood still lingering in the air. Four sets of eyes on my skin, two of which made a chill skitter down my spine. I forced my eyes past Marcus and Ariana, who seemed content at watching me fail, even in D asterisk H. There was no one left alive for me to feed from, to miraculously heal Kate as I had done before. I grabbed hold of Alex's hand my breath coming in short pants. The sound of a heartbeat thudded in my ears, but it wasn't my own. Cade's pulse was slowing, tearing me from my perpetual state of shock. A life without Cade flashed through my head, one where both Alec and I were crippled in our grief, forced to live without ever feeling whole. There were only three flames left, though one was still weak. Cade's flickered and curled growing dimmer with each passing second. Rather than use the soul of someone else, I pulled on both Alec and me. Where I had thought there would be resistance, I found none. Alec's soul willingly leapt at the change to help his brother, his other half just as much as Cade was mine. I tore the sopping suit jacket from Cade's chest, my stomach turning at the sight of his dark blood coating my fingers. Pressing the palm of my hand against his openly bleeding wound, I forced every bit of strength I could into him. A gasp was torn from my throat as I felt the immediate drain, like I was using one of Ariana's knives to cut a piece of my essence. Alec's hand gripped mine tighter, his pain-filled eyes urging me to continue. In that moment, I knew that if I would have tried to save Kate on my own, the effort would have KLD me. A gurgle left him, and he thrashed against my hand. Alec hissed under his breath and used his free arm to pin Cade down. Biting back the sob that threatened to escape, I was bathed in Cade's agony as my magic seared him from the inside out. I held my breath as I felt the tissue and muscle knitting itself together, holding back the blood that continued to flow. Even when spots danced behind my eyes, I couldn't force my lungs to work. Only when color blossomed on Kate's cheeks and his eyelids fluttered, did Alec and I tear our hand from his chest with identical groans of pain. My head thunked against the floor, echoing Alex. That hurts. He hissed through clenched teeth, and I answered with a groan. No one told you to KL yourself trying to save me. Kate grunted, his voice surprisingly clear. Too like an excited puppy. My wolf's ears perked at the sound of his voice, and a rush of energy pulsed through my limbs. I rolled onto my side and managed to sit up, freezing once I realized Cade was already standing. Rubbing at his chest, he stared down at the tiny puncture wound with a scowl on his face. A single bead of blood formed, smearing on his finger. Glancing between Alec and I, Cade came to a conclusion that made his eyes darken and eyebrows knit together. You're hurt. He grimaced, pinning me against his torso while peeling back the shredded pieces of the t-shirt I wore. 
where Ariana's claws had sunken into my shoulders, she had shredded the fabric of the t-shirt. The sting of pain was nothing compared to the drain of her magic. It's not severe, and I'm holding a grudge against you. My warning was weak, and I let out a sigh of relief as his fingers skated across my skin. You jumped in front of a bullet for me gone was the coldness that meant D.H. was creeping. His skin felt warm, and beneath the sinew and muscle, I could hear his strong heartbeat. It was his arms wrapped around my waist that kept me from tumbling to the floor. I clung to his shoulders, tangling my fingers in his hair as I breathed in the scent of sandalwood. And I would do it all again, sweetheart. He chuckled against the hollow of my throat making me shudder. His breath fanned across his mark on my neck, unraveling the knot of utter terror that had formed as I watched him almost d. Alec actually jumped as well. I just happened to be closer to the gun. So, you're telling me I should hold a grudge against both of you? I asked, just a tad breathless. You can try. He smirked. The expression on his rugged face made my insides warm. Even as blood and D asterisk age flashed behind my eyes, those images forever seared into my mind, I found myself smiling. The feel of him against my jaw sent those brutal images scattering. We have a long time to convince you otherwise, but until then, until then, we have so much to do. I sighed but it wasn't one of defeat or resignation. Starting with ending the fight before more wolves d asterisk e. Marcus had damaged the world, though not irreparably. It would take time, so much time but there was finally a chance for peace. Even in this room where so many had died, my mates were able to wipe my mind with smooth words and soft touches. In order to do that, I'm going to need some help standing up. Alec grunted from his place on the floor. He managed to get into a sitting position, but the strain was obvious in his eyes. I placed a hand against the cement wall, using it to support most of my weight. Kate offered a hand to Alec, hauling him up and onto his feet. The two embraced, and a mutual sense of understanding passed between them. No matter how much it would destroy the other, they'd sacrifice themselves first before letting anything happen to me. The thought sent me back to Cade's raspy breaths, but I smothered the fear that rose like a tidal wave. Even though I was weak, I would protect the two of them with every ounce of magic I had. Knowing I would need courage for these next few hours, I steeled my spine and faced my mates. We should take him with us, so we can prove that he's d asterisk d. My voice came out strong, but my stomach flipped at the thought. I could still feel a set of cold eyes on my back, and that lingering sense of fear that returned with each cold chill that skittered down my spine. It would take some time, just like it had when I first began trusting the twins. What about the assassin? Kate asked, the darkness in his voice had me giving him a look of surprise. There was no satisfaction as he glared down at her, just unending loathing. She said you'd rot down here, shouldn't we extend the same courtesy? I hesitated for a moment, feeling my hatred for her rattle in my chest. K asterisk G her hadn't made it go away, nor did it chase away the feeling of her touch as it drained the magic from my body. Forcing myself to look her in the eyes, I knew what I needed to do. No, I won't leave her down here. I shook my head, biting back the bile that stung my throat. Reminding myself that she was D.D., I tried to let go of the burning emotion. I'm not going to spend the rest of my life hating her. If she has family, I'll contact them, and they can have her body. We'll send someone to pick her up later. Right now, we have a war to end. The entire walk back, Marcus's hand dragged across the rocky earth. Thrown over Cade's back after shifting into his wolf form, his silver-plated eyes stared lifelessly into the sky. Alec broke one of his arms when placing him on Cade, and it hung at an awkward angle. 
the crack still echoed in my ears. With both of my mates shifted and at my side, we broke through the forest line and into what remained of the fight. Neither side was relenting, both were on being the victor. Through the snarls and whining of wolves, I could hear Marcus's hand dragging across the earth. Alex stood at my right, snarling, and lunging at anyone who dared come close. There were some whose eyes happened to drift to Marcus's lifeless body, draped over Kate's back like an expensive rug, but their hesitation caused them precious seconds as their opponents took advantage of the distraction. I would have been lost without Alec and Cade, stumbling through this battlefield as I gaped at the DD. The wolves with glassy eyes and torn throats, muzzles forever open or mauled by sharp claws. Homes were burning and car alarms screaming shrilly, trees were overturned, and businesses destroyed. There was even a fire hydrant missing, which bubbled and gurgled as it flooded the street. As we made it to the thickest part of the battle, I prayed that I looked as confident as the twins. The more I looked around, the more I saw, and the less living I noticed. I couldn't tell the difference between the wolves, not by color or any other feature. I couldn't see Tori through the masses, or even Zane and Jaspa. Fear and rage jabbed at me, reminding me of the cold clutches of Ariana's power. The memory snapped something in me, the restraint I had once had. All at once, I pulled from the wolves fighting. Each and every one, whether friend or foe. Hundreds or even thousands of flames, some flickering where others burned bright. There was no need to pull hard, just the smallest amount sent warmth flooding my body. Within seconds my head felt light, the colors around me brighter, somehow. Through the dried blood caked onto my skin, I could feel the puncture wounds in my shoulders closing. As tempting as it was to keep all that power for myself, I released it down and into the earth. I was sure that I was the only one who could feel the sharp pulse that rippled beneath the earth, before the ground began trembling. Wolves were thrown left and right toppling over one another. A crack splintered down the street, kicking up dust and knocking over a stop sign. The only unaffected area was where the twins and I stood. When the dust settled, the fighting had finally stopped. Thousands of eyes pierced my skin, not all friendly. Daggers of hatred and rage, flickers of hope and desperation. Cade tossed Marcus's body to the ground with a sickening thud but I refused to flinch under the eyes of so many wolves. Some instinct buried in my bones wouldn't let me show such weakness. The edges of the crowd moved parting as two wolves charged to the front. One with pale eyes and silver fur, and another with my friend's fiery locks. Zane and Tori were both covered in blood, like most of the other wolves. Their chests were still heaving, but it was Zane I found myself staring at. His eyes were blown white as he stared down at his father, even if I could only feel a whisper of that surprise myself. When he had his fill, undoubtedly convincing himself Marcus was D.D., his eyes flickered up to my own. The barest of movements, but I could have sworn Zane nodded at me. I made my voice as loud as I could without screaming, knowing that my words would ripple over the crowd. I didn't recognize the woman speaking where the lilting tone had deepened into something raspier. This is the man many of you willingly chose to follow. I won't KL you for what you've done, I won't make the same choices Marcus made. The same choices that led him to where he is now, a corpse at my feet. I gave them a few long seconds, clenching my jaw as I stared them down. Those of you who have never been given a choice, here's your first one. Stand down and go back to your families or continue K asterisk G in the name of a man. Many of their eyes weren't on me, but the man at my feet. Silence reigned for so long that I wondered if it would ever end. Confusion and disbelief stained the air, even more potent than the rage coming from those who supported Marcus. The ones who had no choice, they never once considered a life without bowing to the whims of someone else. 
Some wolves stalked into the forest, backing away with narrowed and suspicious eyes. Many shifted or stalked back to half-destroyed homes. The fading scent of blood still lingered in the air, but there was finally a sense of closure. In action movies, the battle itself is always made out to be the worst part. The bloodshed and carnal violence that takes over a man when they're at their lowest. It's the resolution, the clean-up that's the worst part of battle. Counting the DD, placing names to lifeless faces and wolves. It's easier to KL when you don't see the target as a person. I stepped away from Marcus's corpse as Jasper approached, clothed and in human form. At his side was Ava, her face covered in dirt and dried blood. Her onyx hair was singed in some spots, and she rocked on her heels with an elated grin on her face. In her hands were a few stacks of clothes, two of which she sat in front of Alec and Cade. The BS really d asterisk d. She laughed, the sound bordering on a sob as it rang out into the open air. The hours that followed were even darker than battle. When I had thought that Marcus's depravity could reach no lower, Jasper and I stumbled upon where Marcus kept his prized white wolves. Hidden behind a false wall in his mansion, we found countless women imprisoned in rooms identical to what I had been in. Even the touch of the twins couldn't chase the chill from my skin as I watched thirty women leave the cells they had spent years in. Some of the women held infants in their arms, while the other were visibly pregnant. While some looked serene and hopeful, there were a few whose inner light seemed to permanently dim. Some of these women might not want their babies. I told the twins once the women were outside and out of hearing range. I could feel the trauma etched deep in some of them, along with a disconnect between them and the life they carried. It was natural, considering all they must have been through, but both mother and infant deserved a chance. If they want to keep their children, they'll be given everything they need. If not, then they can choose how to proceed. We left Marcus's pack nearly eight hours after the battle had finished. Some of the wolves decided to stay and salvage what was left of their homes, while others chose to follow the twins, Tori, and I back home. What seemed to be brewing between Tori and Zane had been abruptly halted when Tori insisted on coming back. An hour later, Zane, Jaspa, and Ava declared they were coming as well. Jaspa and Zane wanted to talk business with the twins, while Ava's family planned on visiting the twins' pack for a change. I had a sneaking suspicion Zane was coming for more than post-war planning. I knew we were in when we turned onto the street where the twins' house sat. There were nearly a dozen cars, all parked beside the sidewalk. Four sat in the driveway of the twins' house, none of which belonging to their parents. As we found a clear spot down the street and walked up towards the front of the house, I could hear the muffled shouting through the screen door. She is, Garrett. Katie's mom hissed under her breath, flipping back her golden hair with a manicured hand. Mom I could hear Caddy speak, her falsetto hard and full of warning. As I spotted them through the screen door, she at least had the nerve to look apologetic for hurting her mate. You have another daughter, one who has been trained to take over. Caddy and I locked eyes through the flimsy screen. Her entire form stiffened, seafoam eyes wide and golden curls wild. Without missing a beat, a roguish grin stole her face, and she turned to her mother. You know what? I don't want to rule Dad's pack. Actually, I can't think of anything I want to do less. She cackled when her mother's red painted L asterisk PS opened and closed, a sputtering sound emerging. In fact, I think I'm going to enroll at the university. Someone has to take care of the pack, Caddy. Her mother snarled, following closely behind as Caddy strutted past her and through the screen door. You won't have time for school when the words shriveled and died on her tongue as she locked eyes with me, a sourer-looking version of her daughter. L asterisk PS pursed in a perpetual frown, eyebrows knitted together. 
There was obvious disappointment but hidden beneath that was the smallest satisfaction that I hadn't died. I suppose some people were wicked, but not so much as to wish d asterisk h on someone else. Thankfully, the twins and I were no longer covered in blood and grime. We had stopped at a hotel along the ride home. Riding the high of our victory, we stayed up the entire night. In between frantic touches, when I managed to sneak into the bathroom before one of the twins dragged me back into the bed, I swore I could hear Tori and Zane's hushed arguing. Claire. Garrett's voice came from the kitchen, growing louder as he finally emerged through the front door. His face was as concerned as I had ever seen it, and for this one time, I gave in to the ache that settled in my stomach. When he wrapped his arms around my shoulders, pulling me into a crinkled suit jacket that smelled of peppermint and tobacco, I burned the feeling into my memory. I blinked back the tears that stung my eyes because his concern was finally genuine. He wasn't worried for the future leader of his pack, but for his daughter who was fighting a battle much larger than herself. His voice was a bit gruff as he spoke, last any of us heard, you were captured. Your twins aren't very skilled in communication. I was, and it sucked. The twins and Tori rescued me. I began, there's a lot to explain, and actually, I'd like to take some of the credit. Ava called out as she jogged up the driveway, Tori was matching her stride. She had traded her old headphones for a pair of Bluetooth buds, which she consistently lost the entire trip home. Rummaging through the sedan had made her late to the conversation, though that rarely dissuaded her from joining in. Zane might have let your guys in, but who do you think was key in his little plan working? So, you're a white wolf too. I lifted an eyebrow at Katie's tone, and the way she leaned forwards as she looked Ava up and down. Ava noticed as well, smoothing out the dark material of her skirt as she came up onto the porch. I could see her eyes shift, her defenses rising at the sight of another mean girl, but the two stopped in their tracks. A gentle breeze passed through and both girls stiffened. Caddy seemed more surprised than Ava. Realization dawning in the depths of her eyes as her L asterisk PS parted and a strangled gasp emerged. My own eyes widened as I felt their bond snap into place, an unbreakable tether that bound their two souls. I glanced towards Tori, who took half a second to catch up. Caddy, explain this right now. Her mother's voice was almost sharp, worry seeping through the cracks. Tori jumped into action corralling Katie's mother into the house. That's exactly what we're not going to do. You've pushed her away enough, don't do this up too. I heard Tori grunt as the screen door slammed shut behind her. Both Alec and Cade planted a soft K, SS to my forehead before going inside to see their own parents, who were in the kitchen waiting anxiously. Garrett's eyebrows crept up into his hairline eyes darting between his daughter and her mate. Where there was clear indecision from Katie's mother, Garrett felt surprise and just a whisper of joy for his daughter. I'll explain everything inside. I couldn't keep the smile from twitching onto my face as I looped an arm through Garrett's and welcomed the comforting scent of the twins' home. Chapter 120 The sound of muffled arguing emerged from the kitchen most of which held the noticeable soprano of Tori's voice. Every few seconds, I could hear Katie's mom snap back in a venomous tone. Even Garrett was perfectly content with letting them argue, considering he was still processing all that I had told him. He hadn't moved from his position on the couch, his chin resting in the palm of his hand. The same rush of emotion had once washed through me and even now, it was hard to believe that things were changing. Julian sat at his side, unable to conceal the wide grin that stole his face. The exact opposite of his brooding and severe brother. It made him look younger, even though the lines etched into his smooth face were a testament to his age. He leaned forward on his haunches, eyes sparkling. There had always been something feral about Julian. 
still, he was more approachable than Garrett. How'd you KL him, kid? Did he beg? My stomach soured as part of me was torn back to that place, the smell of blood and earth permeating my nostrils as the cold feel of DDI's froze my skin. The sound of shattered bones as her corpse thudded lifelessly against the wall. Porcelain skin, auburn hair, and hazel eyes wouldn't stop looking at me. With a single blink, I was sitting on the couch, Julian's expectant eyes roaming my face. I jolted, startled when Alec opened the door to his father's study and emerged. His eyes found mine instantly as he rounded the corner, and honed on where I sat. Gentle concern coiled around my mind, forcing away those thoughts that brought up the past. It wasn't regretted that festered in my gut, I knew what needed to be done, but the sight of it refused to leave my mind. Kate will be out in a moment. Alec's voice was smooth, even as his thoughts slid into my own. He took a seat on the sectional beside me, smirking as he draped an arm over my shoulders. Are you all right, doll? I know it's affecting you, and there's nothing wrong with that. You did the right thing, but D asterisk H haunts all of us. Before I had chance to answer, the arguing in the kitchen grew louder, until both voices could be heard. She's going to resent you for the rest of her life if you can't accept her. Tori's muffled voice grew sharp as she sent another jab at Veronica. I could taste the anger in her words, like rusted metal that coated the tongue. I was promised a Luna. I am looking out for her future. You have no clue what kind of potential she has. Who are you to tell me about my daughter? I'm someone who can't stand close-minded people. Besides, your daughter needs someone on her side for a change. I could practically see Tori's heated cheeks, her mossy eyes vibrant with rage as they often became when she was worked up. I snickered inwardly when whatever Veronica had to say, died on her tongue. You need to get it through your thick skull. What you want and what she wants are two vastly different things. All you should care about is that your daughter is happy. If you can't accept her, then stay out of her life before you ruin it with your hatred. Before any of us had the chance to feign ignorance, the door swung open, and Tori stormed through. I caught one glance at Veronica's face, her beautiful features distorted in both rage and guilt. There was a mess of emotions in that woman, one that only she could sort out. Tori's eyes, which held at least a dozen individual shades of green, swiveled over to where Garrett sat. This time I couldn't hold back my snicker, not when she moved an eyebrow at him and narrowed her gaze. Do we have a problem? Not at all. Garrett's eyebrows lifted in interest, but he made no move to stand against Tori. Reluctantly, they slid over to Alec and me. He had once been against the twins, enough so to warn me against them. There was no fondness between them, but a sense of respect and a mutual determination for keeping me alive. I'm an advocate for both of my daughter's happiness, no matter who their mates might be. Tori nodded, satisfied with his answer as she turned her head in my direction, I'm going to head outside. That woman gave me a migraine. Bubin helps. Garrett called out from over his shoulder, shrugging half-heartedly as he muttered, she gives me them as well. Kate emerged a few moments later, followed by their parents. Once I was squished between my twins, who had followed through on their promise to never let me out of their sight, I found myself smirking at Garrett. Since you're all for our happiness now, you won't mind if I don't take over your pack, right? I teased, chuckling when he frowned and shook his head. Absolutely not, the pack still needs a Luna. His severe expression softened when he finally caught on. It was still unnerving to stare into those mismatched eyes, which mirrored my own. They flickered over to Julian before he continued, as for the high table, it's your decision whether or not you want to forfeit your place. The girl just won, Garrett. 
give her a moment to celebrate before shoving this down her throat. Julian grunted. She deserves to know the risks Garrett silenced his brother with a harsh look, should you choose to forfeit your place, it'll be given to the second largest pack. You'd be crucial in wars, the largest pack in the world, but without any titles. A useful ally, or a deadly enemy. Your title would protect your pack. No other high table member would dare go after another, especially the head. Julian concluded, I'd think on it carefully. This is your decision, sweetheart. Kate's gruff voice coiled around my mind. Our hands were clasped together, his thumb circling my hand with the same leisurely pace. If you choose not to, we can make sure our pack is protected. Alec promised with a soft smile, and I could feel the truth in his words, but I had thought this through a long time ago. There was plenty of time to think when I was sitting in that bedroom, wondering when Ariana and Marcus would show, what they might have me do oh, I have no intention on giving up my seat at the high table. You don't? Julian asked, interest and smothered excitement permeating the air. Of course not. I'm going to see this through. I smirked at the two of them, my biological father and uncle. One prim and proper, adorned in crisp suits and silky ties. The other just a bit more feral, with wild eyes and shaggy hair. Both alphas with a lifetime of experience, vastly different from one another. You'll help me won't you, the both of you? Surprisingly, my excitement mirrored that of my uncle's. Even with the horrible memories in my head, mixing with the beautiful and unforgettable ones, there was no fear plaguing me. I had irreplaceable people at my side, ready to lend me their wisdom and experience, determined to keep me on my two feet. I wouldn't walk into this world alone, not ever again. A few days later, we all gathered to see Jasper and his warriors off. Many had returned home over the course of the week, but there had been some that remained to protect their alpha. Even Zane, who had been staying in town this entire time, showed to say goodbye. If there was one person who looked as sleep-deprived as me, it was Zane. There were shadows old and new that still swirled in his eyes, finally broken free by the de-asterisk age of his father. He wore a dark dress shirt and a pair of slacks, which was casual for him. I suppose you won't mind me staying in town for a while then, considering you're the new head. Zane's voice broke through my thoughts, his eyes narrowed as though he could tell where they had strayed. I was hyper aware of the fact that Tori stood just a few feet away, her head turned as though she weren't listening, but I could see the way her cheeks heated at his words. I'd also like to speak with your other friends, Alpha Isaiah and Luna Mera. Unsurprisingly, Zane Novak was a man with little in the way of friends. Marcus never needed true born alliances, not when he used fear and power as his weapons. The twins, who had been speaking with Zane increasingly, mentioned the Alpha and Luna who had been crucial in battle. Who will run your pack? There's still so many wolves there. I asked, curious about the white wolves that had chosen to remain behind. All those who supported Marcus were either dead or declared rogues as they fled through the forest. There had been some families who remained, ones who had lived within Marcus's walls for generations. Zane had chosen to step up and repair the devastation his father wrought, rather than run and let others do it for him. I couldn't imagine, facing the people who blamed him, who worked beneath him for all those years. I have someone I trust to watch the pack for the next few months. It might be best for some of the white wolves that I don't show my face for a while. He frowned, and through the small crack in his wall, I could feel a cold whisper of regret against my cheek. It's their choice whether or not they want to stay. They'll be given everything they need to settle into another pack. Those who want to stay will be given jobs, homes, and money to support their families. That's awful generous of you. 
I replied after a few long moments, genuine surprise blossoming on my face. Zane rolled his eyes at the expression, but I didn't miss how they strayed over to where Tori stood, or how his hand quickly found its way to the back of his neck. Marcus had more money than he knew what to do with. Now it's being used. He shrugged, feigning indifference. I was the last to say goodbye to Jaspa, only because I knew we would see one another again. Jaspa Fox had officially stepped down as Alpha, even if he did take over the band of white wolves he had been protecting. His eldest son would soon be taking his seat at the high table and joining in on our mission to heal some of the damage caused by Marcus. She's been nagging me relentlessly about you. Jasper said teasingly as the two of us watched his daughter skip about. Every so often she would vanish mid-hop, only to reappear a few feet away. Where will the two of you go, to your son's pack? Actually, I'm going to Zane's pack to oversee things for a while. He shrugged, flashing a small grin as he watched his daughter laugh and play. I'm bringing along the white wolves under my charge. I think it'll help the others see that this is real, that they truly are free. My eyebrows lifted, so you're the trusted friend. He called me his friend, did he? Jasper's grin widened. Don't poke fun. I smirked, lowering my voice. You're probably the only one he has. MMM, I'm not sure about that. Jasper mused, his eyes flickering to where Zane stood. I'm thinking if he plays his cards right, that little redhead will be his friend in no time. My gaze followed and I couldn't help but notice that again, he and Tori seemed to gravitate towards one another. There was still a general loathing coming from her, but she couldn't bring herself to stay away. My eyes widen a little as I realize that these next few months might give way to a lot of things. Come here, princess. We've got to get going. Jasper called for his daughter, chuckling as she vanished and reappeared in his arms. An errant thought crossed my mind something I had been wondering since watching that gut-wrenching clip on the news. Jaspa. I called out, just as he and his daughter prepared to leave. It's been nagging me. How did you make thousands of white wolves vanish before Marcus got to your pack? There was no trace of any of you. Jaspa moved his head to the side, his daughter squealing and giggling in his arms. An untraceable grin formed on his face his eyes flashing with manic joy. Mere seconds before he and his daughter vanished, he replied. Who says we ever left? Chapter 121 Two months later one deep breath, and then another. Relax, Claire. Zane's flat voice sounded from a few feet in front of me, icy eyes pivoting across the lounge to meet my own. Ever since his father's D asterisk H, there were moments where he seemed carved from ice. The only one able to thaw him was currently waiting along with the rest of the crowd. Whether they know it or not, they're looking for a leader, someone better to replace Marcus. Speak with confidence and they'll listen. He isn't wrong. Brandon Fox shrugged. The only similarities between Jaspa and his eldest son were the piercing eyes and lazy grin. Everything else, including the golden hair, came from his mother. Still, she is not wrong to be worried. There are some that won't be happy with this decision. Isaiah chimed in, the voice of reason as he stood second in line. What do you think? I asked the last member of the high table who stood at the front of the line. Isabella Garcia was only two years older than me, from a large pack that took up most of New Mexico and Arizona. Her warriors had been too far away to aid in the battle, but her pack had its own history with helping white wolves. As the sole child of an alpha, she was beside herself when I sent the invitation. She swallowed heavily, eyes still white and nervous. I think if he wants to make up for his family's mistakes, this is the best place to do that. 
Her voice was strong, her thick accent almost musical. All right, is everyone ready? Carrie Heald, an event planner from Garrett's Pack barged into the room, her wheat hair pulled into a tight bun. He had hired her two months ago, when I decided to take my place at the high table. Sticking from the back of her bun was the pen she would continuously lose. Even with her frazzled state, she was utterly amazing at her job. Once the twins and our family decided on a safe location for the high table's headquarters, Carrie took control of orchestrating the entire event. The concert hall had been renovated just a year ago and was the perfect size. Our warriors scoured the building while Carrie transformed it. All right, Isabella you're going to head out first. Count to thirty and then go. Carrie grinned encouragingly, nudging her to the set of doors that lead downstairs and to the stage. Claire you're last. As Isabella descended the stairs, I took a steadying breath. I hear your Luna ceremony is this weekend. Brandon murmured over his shoulder, his grin mirroring Jasper's. His voice held an air of mock offense, is there any particular reason I didn't receive an invite? Are we not friends, Claire? Isaiah followed soon after, my heart thundered with each step I took. I didn't know you'd want to go. I snorted at him, feeling some of my nerves skitter away at his teasing voice. I'm twenty-three and unmated, he smirked, and I swallowed heavily as it was now Zane's turn. Of course, I want to go. Consider yourself invited. I said breathlessly, doing my best to return the encouraging smile he threw my way. As Brandon exited down to the stage, I headed towards the doors as well. Deep breaths, Claire. Carrie clasped my sweaty hand in her own. It wasn't her words that gave me the strength to press forward and follow the other table members, but the confidence in her emotions. This woman I had met a handful of times, had spoken to only once during her task of setting everything up, believed in me wholeheartedly. I emerged through a set of double doors, squaring my shoulders as I was met with a small crowd of reporters. Velvet ropes and dark-clothed warriors from all three of my packs served as the barrier between the reporters and me. Their questions thundered in my ears, almost as loud as my thundering heartbeat. Keep your head straight and answer no questions until you're seated on stage. That's what Carrie had told me, and I followed her advice as I lifted my chin and headed downstairs. I could feel several guards at my back. They were looming presences that felt a little overbearing at times, but the twins insisted they were a necessity. My stomach dropped as I descended the stairs, feeling the weight of the crowd and their emotions nearby. Tugging at the edges of my mind as they loomed closer and closer. The sound of my own heartbeat dulled, replaced by silence so deafening my ears began to ring. My footsteps pattered against the smooth floor, the crowd grew quiet. White hot lights were bright as they illuminated the stage, and I made my way across to stand at the center, lodged between Zane and Brandon. A million thoughts were streaming through my head the most concerning were the loudest. Could they see how frazzled I was? How entirely new this all felt? Did they know how desperately I wanted to fix things? That when the nightmares continued to claim me, I'd stay up all night searching for solutions. You look as calm as ever, doll. Alex's smooth voice trickled into my thoughts, sanding down the harsh edges of my panic like a natural-born leader. The only ones who can tell how you're feeling is us. Cade chimed in, his voice a bit raspier than his brother's. I strained my eyes to peer out into the crowd, immediately finding where my family and mates sat. Much like in Marcus's old council room, we divided the seating in the concert hall to fit the various packs that wished to attend. All the Alphas and Lunas were seated towards the front. Each were given a microphone to speak, so that their voice could be heard as well. They would remain off while the five of us were speaking, but it was a way to give the smaller packs a voice. 
It was the twin's dark stares that kept the sea of emotions from barreling over me. There were so many people, and nerves were still raw from the devastation and change that rocked the world. I stood tall, and braced myself against the torrents of weariness, indecision, and worry. A whisper of hostility hovered in the air, but the desperation for any semblance of peace was far more vicious will they revolt. Kate asked softly, his voice making the hairs on the back of my neck lift. I gave the barest shake of my head before stepping forward, leveling my eyes with the crowd like Carrie instructed. I understand that many of you are wary. I began, hardening my nerves until my voice came out steady and smooth. My expression was one of compassion and understanding, something Marcus was incapable of showing. I will not speak for Zane Novak, but he does have the full support of the high table. All I ask is that you listen to what he has to say. There is no apology I can make that will give back the lives lost, or the pain that has been endured. I am not here to ask for your forgiveness. Zane's face was smooth granite, his voice heavy even though it lacked the snowstorm of emotion he currently felt. I couldn't help but zero in on where his eyes were straying, to the redhead in the front row. Something had happened recently between my best friend and her mate. It sent Zane's emotional wall crumbling down, but still he hid the rawest and darkest parts of himself. He had fled back to his pack last week, and Tori had been furious ever since. One thing I could feel for certain, no matter how hard he tried to hide it. He had fallen in love with my best friend. My fear condemned thousands of wolves, and it is a debt I'll never be able to repay. Those I rescued behind Marcus's back were a mere shadow of what I could have saved, should I have stood up to him. I'll spend the rest of my life trying to fix the damage my family has wrought. There was little sympathy for Zane but he hadn't asked for any to begin with. The grim determination on his face followed by the dark shadows around his eyes soothed some, but others would prove harder to convince. The five of us spent the next hour discussing the changes that would be implemented immediately, both within our respective packs and throughout the country. It had taken us all a month to plan and agree on our plans, but what we had produced was just the beginning. Before the new year, all the freed white wolves would be successfully implemented into whatever pack they happened to choose. Children would enroll in schools, parents would receive jobs and educations. Houses will be filled, and families given the necessary aid to help them begin healing. It would never be enough, but their future generations will no longer fear the ghost of Marcus Novak. The five of us were opening our borders to all white wolves in search of a place to call home. There were even a few that chose to remain in Zane's pack, those who sided more with Zane and the difference he had made. My favorite change of law, which happened to be one of the largest in our history, took time and planning. No longer would Lunas be prohibited from taking a seat at the high table. No longer would only daughters of Alphas forfeit their rights to their pack the people they had been raised beside and taught to love. Garrett and Julian had broken that rule when first meeting me, because gender was not nearly as important as the well-being of their people. It had taken five minutes of convincing to sway Zane, and the threat of Tori spazzing on him. There was no way she'd stay quiet if he voted no on this. Brandon agreed with a cheeky grin that made me roll my eyes and Isaiah was more than happy to give strong Lunas like Mara a chance at making history. Isabella gave the fifth vote, and the law was passed. Towards the end, we allowed the Alphas and Lunas in attendance to ask questions. Some were sharp of tongue and narrow-eyed, but none seemed in the mood to fight. Their questions were all based out of genuine concern. Even the packs that hid and cowered had a chance at speaking. One Luna in particular stood and spoke softly into her microphone. Her hair was cropped short and the fine lines on her face led me to assume she was in her early forties. Her eyes were a warm shade of brown, brimming with curiosity and hesitance. Hello, Luna Claire. 
I hope you take no offense to my question, but where are the previous members of the high table? Sebastian Stan, Brayden Cliff, and Nico Deville? I am only asking because I do not see them in attendance tonight. It is not strange of me to wonder how these new packs grew in size, especially after the downfall of so many large houses. I took a shallow breath, repeating the words of Alec and Kate as they trickled through my head. Their warm stares on my skin chased away the nerves, giving me the confidence to speak clearly. Sebastian Stan was rumored to have fled his land due to an uprising. His remains were found two weeks ago, still within his Pax territory. My voice turned dark, and I remembered when his body had been found. His own people had torn him apart and scattered the remains. Braden Cliff and Nico Deville have both been removed from their position and are currently undergoing extensive investigations to ensure no white wolves are unwillingly living on their lands. Chapter 122 My Luna ceremony commenced the following weekend, making Carrie even more frazzled as she planned last-minute details. Day by day, her buns became just a tad messy. Flower arrangements, guest lists, and food. She had even gone as far to search for entertainment. I had all but forbade her to make an event out of it, but the twins ordered her not to listen. Streamers of cobalt and powder blue wrapped around the light posts in town, hanging brightly decorated wreaths. Storefronts hung lights, and laughter trickled in through the cracks of devastation. The crowd of guests that cheered when I walked under the pavilion erected in the park made my face flush. The positive emotions made me giddy as I passed from guest to guest, riding the high of happiness and celebration. As the ceremony commenced, the joy in my stomach turned to worry. Self-doubt lingered at the corners of my mind, fleeing only when the twins came into sight. Alec had trimmed his hair for the occasion, though the sides were still a tad shorter than the top. Kate's hair was unruly as ever but the look made him seem darker more dangerous as he stood there waiting for me. You have nothing to fear, sweetheart. His gruff voice was soft, a tone reserved only for my ears and our deepest thoughts. You've been Luna of all three packs for a long time now. This ceremony is just a formality. And a future headache. Alec's playful voice helped slice through the final shreds of my reluctance, until excitement once again returned. The ceremony itself was short, not nearly as complex as a human marriage despite how complicated it actually was. After swearing my life and loyalty to all three packs, and a nasty slice to the palm of my hand, the voices of thousands filled my mind. I had been warned about this part, but there was no training available for something like this. Focus, doll. Alec warned, his voice breaking through the sea of chaos. You can tune them out. It's all within your control. You're their Luna. Drowning in a sea of sound and emotion, I swam towards the sound of Alec's voice. Slowly, the chaos dimmed, and I could hear past the ringing in my ears. When I was finally able to open my eyes, a second of silence ensued before the surrounding crowd erupted in cheers. Brandon Fox stood at the front, an ear-splitting grin on his that night was one I'd always remember, and not because I danced hours of it away with Alec. I had nearly fell over laughing as Brandon flitted from she-wolf to shwolf, his charm effectively failing him each time. Even Cade begrudgingly swept me onto the dance floor during a particularly slow song, his eyebrows knitted into a scowl while his cheeks burned a light shade of pink. By the time the music ceased, and Alec pulled me into his arms, I had realized I hadn't seen Tori or Zane for the last few hours. I know you're worried about Tori, but from what I heard in the guest house, you'd only be interrupting by seeking her out. He chuckled low in my ear, making my mouth pop open in surprise. Besides, we have something better in mind, a celebration of our own. Really? I hummed, my breath hitching as his arms wound around my waist. 
what will we be celebrating? Not you, just us. Cade's chuckle brushed the back of my neck, his arm snaking around from the back. I don't think celebrate is an appropriate word for what Alec and I have planned. We plan to worship you, Luna Claire. I followed the twins from the party, my cheeks aching from the smile plastered to my face and a fire burning low in my stomach. At the time, I hadn't fully grasped what the twins had planned. I was swept into muscular arms the moment we entered the house, pinned to the bed with rough hands and heated skin. They snarled and snapped at one another, fighting for the sweetness between my legs. Coarse hands held me down while I thrashed and screamed onto Cade's tongue, all whilst Alec whispered sweet words of encouragement. The two took their time with me, passing me between the other as my own energy waned. I savored the roughness and desperation in their touch, the feral need to imprint themselves on me in every way possible. By the time my eyes fluttered shut from exhaustion, I felt Alec's hand dip between my legs. We have another surprise for you, doll. His voice was husky from what little sleep we managed. I jolted a bit when I realized he held a cold washcloth in his hand and was wiping away at the remains of their seed as it had dried to my thighs. It took some time to dress and ready myself, especially when my leg muscles groaned, and my core throbbed in remembrance. Even Cade, with his gruff demeanor, was more of a morning person than me. His touch was gentle as he helped me into a t-shirt and offered a hand my surprises out of town. I asked curiously, my eyes flitting through the forest as we passed down one of the town's many back roads. Deeper into the forest we ventured, where small roads branched off the main one, leading to private houses and cabins. Just as I readied myself to ask another question, Cade slowed the sedan and turned onto a small gravel road. The vehicle tilted back and forth on the rocky ground, but within seconds we were pulling up to the front of a small house. The wooden boards were painted a sunny shade of yellow, and the wrap-around porch was covered in plants. Wide, tropical leaves hung from a lattice against the porch. Flowers with emerald vines wrapped around the railings, sprouting petals of fuchsia and violet. No way! I gasped, all but leaping from the sedan as Sage stepped onto the front porch. Her glossy grey hair was braided down her shoulder and back, her eyes creased as a smile of her own lit her face. The plants nearest to her swayed in the breeze, reaching towards the woman who radiated so much life and light looks like you took my advice, dear. Her voice hinted at her age but the youth in her eyes shimmered like fragments of the sun. Her smile widened as Alec and Cade stepped from the vehicle, and then some. How is this possible? I laughed, surprised but not offended when she pulled me in for a hug. Sage smelled of earth and petals, honey and herbs that clung to the thick strands of her hair. I thought you and your son were hidden away in the forest. Oh, we were happy there too. Sage chuckled, your twins sent a few men to my door when things started going south. Nearly sent them packing until they mentioned a Luna Claire. My instincts never failed me once, and they were telling me to pack up and leave. I miss my garden, but your mates here provided me with a suitable replacement. Even if the land's fallen into disrepair. You seem to be enjoying fixing things up around here. Alex smirked crossing his arms over his broad chest. He poked at one of the leaves nearby, actually, it looks like there's a lot more plants here today than there were a few days ago. Of course, there is. I control the plants, after all. Sage snapped, but a grin tugged her. Her eyes flickered over to where I stood, come inside, dear. I sent my son to the store a few hours ago told him not to come back until he's mated. Sage and I talked for hours, long enough that the twins grew restless. I couldn't contain my happiness when Sage told me she planned to stay here, making this house and pack her home. It would take her some time to get used to the change, 
no longer having to hide and use her magic in fear. Her son returned home as the sun began to set. He muttered a gruff hello and sauntered into the kitchen. I hadn't the courage to ask if he had found his mate, but I hoped the nervous excitement fluttering in his chest was a good sign. Nearly a week later, after all the excitement had died down, I received a phone call I hadn't realized I'd been waiting for. One missed voicemail, Melissa. I listened to that voicemail more times than I cared to admit, desperately trying to discern the emotion in her words without having to meet her face to face. Her voice, though like my own, was throatier from her smoking habit. It was something she did only when she was stressed. Frank had left her for the cashier at the liquor store, a college dropout named Sadie. He had tried to run and cower after getting the girl pregnant, to which Melissa promptly kicked him out. I could hear the flick of her lighter in the background, followed by the muttered curse when she failed to light her cigarette. She wanted to meet with me, to talk about the past and what kind of future we might salvage together. The twins never once discouraged me from meeting her, no matter how much buried pain she had caused. For some reason, which I still couldn't figure out, I agreed. Standing on the faded boards that made up the front porch sent a feeling of unease skittering through my gut. A memory of fear as it flashed through my head, trying to turn me into the girl I was before. The one who ran instead of facing her problems, who left the shattered pieces for everyone else to clean up. Her wheat-colored hair was curled when she answered the door, a pale blue eyeshadow was dusted across her lids. Nude L, P's tick and gloss coated her L, P's. The blush on her face showed off her high cheekbones and fair skin. She was wearing her best clothes, a dress skirt, and heels with a silk blouse. The first knife in my gut was the flash of disappointment when she realized I had arrived alone. Alec and Kate waited in the car, this wasn't something I wanted an audience to. Maybe I was punishing myself, but I followed her into the house I had lived in, but never once called home. The faint undertone of air freshener clung to the cracked leather couch and chipped coffee table. A container of antiseptic wipes sat on the counter. The dishes were done and stacked in neat piles. The house was cleaner than it had been in the months I lived here. Claire, sweetheart. How have you been? I frowned at the nickname she called me, the one Kate often used. It felt off coming from her, twisted and warped. Her voice was soft, but it was the emotions beneath I found myself interested in. There was no emotion towards Frank's betrayal. At the very least, I had expected anger. Understanding blossomed like blood-stained petals when she continued speaking, I heard about your ceremony it's like a promotion, right? Or a coronation. At one point, I would have seen the light in her eyes and mistaken it for fondness, perhaps I'd even convince myself that some small, motherly part of her was proud of me. That her own interests were cast aside just this once, for the child she never wanted. It was my abilities that both released and caged me I could feel the desperate, clawing need as it rattled in her ribcage like a starved beast. The harsh regret like an ash-coated tongue, and the greedy desire to claim it all. The realization that life was fleeting, and what had she done with hers but ruin it. Like a snake, I could feel her slithering close with every silent step she took. Venomous to even those closest because a snake could never change its own nature, nor would it apologize. Somewhere in the back of my mind, a child cried out for the warmth of her mother. Her heart broke for this woman more times than I could count, the pain shoved down until it seeped into our blood and hardened our heart. Like any smart predator, she could see the change in my eyes. The hardness that took over as I stared right through her. I wondered if she could feel me probing, picking at her deepest emotions with the honed scalpel of my abilities. Slicing back bitter memories and fits of jealousy, rage and frustration shoved onto the shoulders of a child. You can't hurt me anymore. 
I said softly, finally freeing myself from her. Have a good life, Mom. Her fractured sobs filled the house, ringing in my ears as I turned my back on her. I descended the porch steps, back to the men who claimed every inch of my soul, devoured my pain, and replaced it with unconditional love. The ghost of a smile crawled across my L, P.S. because for once, her regret was true. Chapter 123 One year later I glanced down at the old article I had saved, snickering at my name in such a bold font. I wasn't sure I'd ever get used to it, having every werewolf in the world know my name. A photo of the twins and I sat below the headline, my odd-colored eyes bright and vibrant. I was glowing with happiness as I stood between the twins like a light had been switched on deep within. Kate stood behind me, his arms wound around my waist as I grinned and stared into Alex's eyes. None of us were expecting a hidden reporter to snap the photograph. Even after an entire year, my love for my mates hadn't dimmed. If anything, it had grown stronger. It was my favorite picture of the three of us. The reporters had a field day when the twins and I were finally married. The ceremony was mostly for show, an excuse to throw an extravagant party that would lighten spirits and spread some happiness. The public were invited, along with various alphas and lunas from around the country. The legality of it all was questionable considering I couldn't technically marry two men, but many mates chose not to marry at all. Even though it had been a calculated move, I didn't have to fake my joy that day. Carrie had planned the wedding for months, but it was Zane who provided a venue. This wasn't a private event meant for friends and family, but something we wanted to include the world in. The field was barren when we arrived covered in potholes and patchy grass. It was used as a concert venue, where stages and booths would be erected. Trash littered the field, ranging from harmless beer cans to used condoms and cigarette packs. The grass was used to being trampled by excited feet, but it wasn't aesthetically pleasing for a wedding. Carrie, with full access to our funds, transformed the venue in a matter of a month. I had asked countless times how she managed to get everything completed so quickly, but her response was always the same. A cheeky grin and the mention of a few people owing her some favors. Tori claimed the position of maid of honor before I had the chance to speak and was rather passionate about the wedding planning. It put her in the presence of Zane, who had retreated to his own pack shortly after my Luna ceremony, but Tori still enjoyed putting him in his place. I was sure she also enjoyed the way his eyes trailed her every move when her back was turned, but I kept my mouth shut while they bickered with one another. I hadn't asked what was happening between the two of them. I felt like my constant intrusion on her emotions was information enough. Their bond was growing stronger, but the two continued to heads. Zane was dealing with the loss of his father, a man he both hated and wanted to please. There were demons in his eyes that wanted to him, but Tori refused to let him sink. The wedding had taken my breath away, along with the crowd that had showed up. The parking lot was completely packed, a sea of vehicles that all looked identical in the darkness. In between those cars were guests, donned in delicate dresses and suits, walking towards the gates that would lead them to the guard station. It was a precaution that the guests and their bags were searched before the wedding. Light posts covered in ivy lined the way, like a trail of starlight and nature. As you reached the entrance to the party, a domed lattice formed overhead with small fairy lights interwoven through the wooden beams. Vines with dainty white flowers trickled down, bringing the gentle scent of something sweet. After the ceremony had finished and the party truly began, I spent the rest of the night with the twins by my side. Their individual scents made me dizzier than the wine I had consumed, making my heart light and cheeks ache from smiling so much. I managed to steal Tori away from a couple of lusty guys vying for her attention and tugged her onto the dance floor. What was that about? She chuckled, 
grabbing my hand as she twirled onto the dance floor. All three of them were wanting in that dress of yours. I snickered, relaxing as the thundering beat of the music flooded my ears. Tori's distaste was instant, but I hadn't yet finished. I glanced across the room, meeting with a pair of silver eyes that held barely contained rage. And a certain alpha seems a bit enraged by the entire thing. Maybe you should talk with him. Brandon Fox and his mate made an appearance, and the few reporters invited chattered excitedly as they snapped photographs of the alpha. He hadn't stopped grinning since meeting Alicia, not once. I had spoken to her while Brandon and the twins talked about crossing future training courses, and found she was incredibly kind and a tad shy. Jasper had arrived separate from his son, with Delilah and his mate in tow. His mate was a soft-spoken woman, petite in stature even though she rivaled Jasper with a single look. After leaping into my arms and stating I looked like a princess, she vanished into the crowd with some of the other children present. The twins and I mingled with the other guests, Alec doing much better than his brother. I could tell Cade was trying, but the bluntness to his words often chased people off. After an hour of chatting with various guests and families, my attention started straying. We ventured through the crowd, searching for Caddy and Ava. I found them both with Veronica, who gave me a sour look before turning to Caddy. Instead of rolling my eyes at the adoration on Veronica's face as she looked at her daughter, I was happy for Caddy. The day they met, and Tori chewed Veronica out, it changed something in her. It wasn't an easy road, but Veronica was making a conscious effort to put what Caddy wanted first. When Caddy was accepted into the Art Institute a few hours away, her mom had been her biggest supporter. The happiness on Katie's face as she danced with Ava, her golden curls swishing down her pastel gown, it was the purest emotion I had felt. I wanted that same happiness for my best friend, whose all-consuming emotions grew stronger the more she resisted the bond's pull. As she continued to pull Zane from the clutches of his demons, I only hoped that she wouldn't herself. Their emotions were like the rapids, tearing me back and forth before dousing me in icy water. I had no choice but to listen, to feel every blast of sizzling rage or pulse of repressed desire. She was the only one to get any sort of reaction out of Zane, who still held those shadows from that horrible night. Sometimes I swore they would vanish completely when he and Tori were truly at each other's throats. Shortly after the ceremony, I had lost sight of Tori. When I finally spotted her fiery hair through the crowd, my jaw threatened to clatter to the floor. They were towards the edge of the property, where the lights were dimmer, but I could never mistake the hunger in their emotions. Even with the other guests surrounding them, they only had eyes for one another. Her curves melted into the slate grey suit he wore, her emerald dress matching the colour of Zane's tie. Tori's manicured fingers were on his neck grazing the pulse point of his throat as a coy smile formed on her face. The look was dripping with smugness and even from where I stood, I could feel the hitch in his pulse and the sudden explosion in his emotions. They were having a private conversation out of earshot, and I refused to venture any further. His desire to attend the wedding plummeted, just as his desire to steal her away increased. The night of my wedding, Things changed between Zane and Tori. Two weeks later, she asked permission to move into Zane's pack. I'll never be able to wipe the image of her teary eyes from my mind, the way they resembled fresh moss and glittering jewels. The depth of her emotions hit me, sparking tears in my own. She felt guilty for leaving, for missing him as desperately as she did. I would miss her more than words could express but this wasn't the time for mourning. Through trial and tribulation, my best friend had found her happiness. I looked at her through my own tears, both joyful and devastated. I could already feel the loss of her in my chest, even though we would always stay in contact. With a smile on my face, 
I embraced my best friend. You've always been a Luna, Tori. You've never needed my permission to find your happiness. You'll visit, you got that? I'll tell you everything that happened how it all changed. She sniffled, wiping her eyes with the back of her hand. And I'm going to come back as often as possible. I'm still your beta, even if I can't physically be there. Promise me, Claire. You were there for me when no one else was, even if I refused to believe it at the time. I'll always be there for you, no matter what. A piece of my heart followed Tori when she left, just as a piece of hers stayed behind, but we both followed through on our promise to each other. We made time to video chat every weekend, no matter how hectic our schedules became. When my birthday rolled around that spring, I woke the entire house with my shouts as Tori and Zane pulled up in a tinted SUV. I had barely managed to throw on one of Kate's t-shirts and a stray pair of boxers before I stumbled out the front door and down the porch steps. Tori cackled with glee as we collided in a mess of tangled limbs, the dew from the grass seeping into our clothes. Her fiery hair was longer and tamer, but her eyes shimmered with the same happiness I often saw in my own. Zane smirked down at the two of us, his chestnut hair shorter and eyes not as haunted. His emotions were clearer, and I was startled at the fierce protectiveness hidden beneath his casual facade. I nearly lost it when he extended a hand to Tori and me. He helped me to my feet and tugged her into his arms, giving me a wry smile. Happy birthday, Claire. This birthday was the first I had spent with the twins and was much different than what I was used to. Melissa had rarely acknowledged my birthday, and eventually it became another monotonous day. Frank's attention seemed to fall on me more, which didn't exactly boost my excitement. I had nearly forgotten it was my birthday altogether, until the twins hauled me into one of the cars and took off. Where are we going? I asked Alec, who was currently driving. The overconfident smirk he flashed me through the rear view was of no help, so I turned to Cade. Any time we would drive, one of the twins would sit in the back with me. It was a way to remain close to them, even if they did bicker over who would sit with me. I told you two not to get me anything. I have everything I could ever want. Cade's response was a deep chuckle, and a thick blindfold in his hands. I swatted them away, my breath hitching when he grabbed both of my wrists and pinned them in between his thighs. The moment my hands were free, I reached for the blindfold obscuring my vision. Sweetheart, as much as I'd love to see you restrained, the car isn't the place I had in mind. Kate's warm breath fanned across my cheek, making my heart jump. His hand landed on my lap, just below the skirt I wore, the rough pads of his fingers splayed out on me. Now behave and let us have our fun. I knew we had arrived when Alec stopped the vehicle and shifted it into park. Kate held both of my wrists within his hand. For safety measures, he had claimed. The two of them kept me from falling on my face as I struggled to find my balance I could hear the gentle rush of wind as it passed my ears, along with the sound of passing cars. The muffled chatter of people far away sounded, growing nearer with every passing second. Cade led me forwards with his hands on my H, P.S. A dull click sounded, followed by the soft jingle of a bell. The first thing I noticed was the immediate scent of plants, with an underlying tone of something sweet. I felt Cade's fingers at the back of my head, pulling the blindfold from my eyes. It's a bakery. The words sounded flat and full of disbelief as I turned on my heel and gawked at the fully furnished store. The walls were white brick, but artwork covered most of the wall space. The smooth marble counters glittered under the gentle, golden lights. A large display area sat empty, followed by another below the counter. Twinkling lights hung on the back wall, where a large chalkboard menu sat. 
circular tables were in clusters with pale blue chairs and soft throw pillows. A couple of love seats sat against the far wall, with the same pastel color scheme as the rest of the store. Potted plants hung from the ceiling in front of the large windows, soaking up the sunlight as it poured through. It's your bakery. Alex smirked, sharing a smug look with Cade that made my face heat. You can't get me a bakery. I stammered, not looking at either one of them. I was too busy gawking at the shiny new kitchen, with the large freezer and steel stovetop. I gave them both an exasperated look when one chuckled, I got you two shirts for your birthday last year. Shirts. They were nice shirts. Alec nodded appreciatively, a smile twitching at his L, P.S. Besides, you took us on that picnic for our birthday. Heat flooded my face as I struggled for an answer. The picnic Alec mentioned wasn't a picnic at all. A week before their birthday we decided to shift and go on a run, which quickly turned into the three of us taking a break in this sprawling meadow of golden grass. The only thing they had eaten during this picnic had been myself. That was not a part of your birthday a scream ripped through my throat as I inched too close to the marble countertop and saw someone jump out from beneath. Surprise! Beth cackled, her sand-colored ponytail swishing back and forth as she jumped in place. It took me several seconds to rein in my shock and embarrassment. Her warm eyes flickered between me and the twins, sparkling deviously. Your husband's here tracked me down. I'll forgive the lack of wedding invite if you explain to me how it is you managed to snag the two of them, and if you can point me towards a set of my own. I'm not sure I can help find you a set of twins, but I can tell you all about how we met. I teased, how's Jake doing? Has he burned the bakery down yet? Jake ditched the bakery for a corporate advertising internship. Beth scoffed in mock offense but shrugged. It's not a total loss. He's officially the bakery's one-man advertising team. Now let's get in this kitchen, I want to see how much you remember. Go on, enjoy your bakery. Alec grinned, his thoughts merging with my own. You know I love you both, right? I sighed, disgruntled with the guilt that sat in my chest at accepting such a huge gift. The emotion pricked at the backs of my eyes until Cade took a few strides forward and swept me into his arms. Beth's wistful sigh sounded in the background. You deserve everything, sweetheart. His voice was gruff, and his plush lips soft as they brushed ever so softly against my own. The twins were insistent that I explore the bakery, knowing the more I touched and marveled, the more I fell in love with the quaint shop. It was easy to keep up with Beth's enthusiasm as she chittered and cooed over the giant cooler and the stacked ovens. The industrial mixer nearly sent her into a meltdown, especially considering it was a pale shade of pink. How long are you going to be in town for? I asked, but she read my mind. I'll be in town for the month. I'll help you hire employees, order ingredients and supplies and have everything ready to open up. She grinned wildly, thankfully your husband's had the place decorated, that saves us some time. Even though I do think they could have used a tad more pink. Chapter 124 Three years later my back arched and eyes rolled back as molten pleasure coiled between my legs, increasing with every desperate of Cade's tongue. My hands were tangled in his hair tugging him closer while also pushing him away. His snarls vibrated against my slick folds, coaxing unfathomable sounds from me. The man ate like he was starving, devouring every inch of my swollen flesh with his L, P.S., tongue and teeth. Alec lay beside me, the heavy length of him pressed against my H, P as he stroked and played with me. Lavishing kisses down my neck and shoulder. Goosebumps erupted where his light caresses fell, even though the air around us was humid and warm. Both he and Cade were entranced, feasting on me as they had countless times, 
only this time their attention would stray down to my stomach, to the swell of life hidden within my womb. They were achingly gentle with me. To the point where my core throbbed, begging to be taken until my throat grew hoarse and my legs sore. I'm not going to break, you know. I whimpered for the thousandth time. It was slow, agonizing pain. Gradually leading up to the moment where I inevitably fell. Shattering again and again, until my limbs trembled, and my body cried out for reprieve. Both Alec and Kate's protective instincts shot through the roof the moment they spotted the positive pregnancy test. I had taken a dozen of them, staring open-mouthed in the mirror. I had been on birth control for years now, but last month I decided to switch to a different brand. There was a one-week waiting period, which I was certain we hadn't missed but something must have gone wrong. There had never been a time in my life where I imagined myself as a mother. Any time my mind would stray that far ahead I'd see flashes of my own, a cigarette hanging from her mouth as spat at me not to leave my room. I hadn't thought about Melissa much since letting her go, but this sent me reeling back to those years ago. When I had been too frightened and berated to fight back. My heart shattered and repaired itself when the twins found me, scooping me into the safety of their arms. They demolished the gnarled vines of my panic and HR, letting the sun break through with strength and hope. You're not her. Kate reminded me, the adoration in his voice made me take a shaky breath. You've never been her. It's your choice, doll. We'd never force something like this on you. Alec's voice was close behind, a soothing melody to Kate's intense tone. When we decide to have one, our child will be happy and loved. They'll never know the things you've went through. Cade continued, his L, P.S. twitching into a soft grin. Not with a mother who can feel their every emotion. Neither pestered me for an answer, even though I could feel their minds whirling at the fact that one might be a father. As I drifted in and out of sleep, I could feel their wonder, along with a feather-light touch that swept along my abdomen. That night, when they thought I was sleeping, I heard the promise they made to one another. Everything changes if she decides to keep it. Alec chuckled incredulously, I wasn't afraid of going into battle, not even the first time, but I'm terrified at the thought of being a father. Things have been changing since our maid killed Marcus Novak. Cade's voice was one of unflinching strength, pouring confidence with every syllable. I turned my face into the pillow when tears flooded my eyes, formed by how strongly Cade believed his words. She will be the best mother, no matter what point in her life she bears our children. Our children will never know neglect. They'll never feel unloved or ignored. I actually can't think of anyone better suited. They went quiet for a few moments, and I wondered if they were talking over Mind Link. I fought to keep my breathing slow, even with the traitorous tear trailing down my cheek. For their entire lives, Cade was the rock that refused to break against the harsh current of the ocean. Even though his anger could easily get the best of him, he had always been a steadying presence for Alec and now myself. It doesn't matter who's technically the father, you know that right? Alec broke the silence his soft voice startling me from the clutches of sleep. If she wants a DNA test, I'll agree to it, but it wouldn't change anything for me. Mom and Dad used to joke that we were the same soul, split into two different bodies. We've shared everything since we were kids, even a pack, and now we share a mate. As far as I'm concerned, the role of father is something else we can share. Claire's right. You can be sweet when you want. Alec teased, and I smiled into the pillow as Cade grumbled. I've never needed a best friend because I knew no one would understand like you do. No matter what she decides, I've never regretted her having you as a mate. She needs both of us. Sleep came quickly, sweeping me away as the twins slid into bed, their body heat chasing away the chill. 
I slept without a single dream or monster-infested nightmare for the first time in months, comforted by the decision I had just made. I was thrust into a world I never knew existed, and quickly learned that running from my problems wouldn't make them go away. I had dealt with so much more than I ever thought possible. Felt more emotion than a single human could bear, but I came out on the other side. The nightmares were a punishment I'd happily pay, to keep the family I had finally found. Other than immediate family, we decided not to tell the public until a gender was announced. Our pack would celebrate the Luna or Alpha who would someday rule in our stead. It was still surreal, to think that I was carrying the future of this pack within my womb the twins catered to me, treating me with a reverence that was almost religious. At four months, the swell of my stomach was noticeable beneath tight-fitting clothes. I had opted for oversized t-shirts that looked far too large on my small form, but it allowed me to continue working at the bakery. The twins had tried to draw the line at me working, but after three failed attempts, one would stay behind to hover over me, like a worried mother hen. Typically, it was Alec who stayed. After a month, he had learned a thing or two in the bakery and was useful as he kept pace at my side. When the six-month mark rolled around, I finally stepped back from working at the bakery. The team of employees I had hired, which ranged from a few high school students to some college dropouts and even a small-time pastry chef or two, already noticed the changes in me. Tori and Zane arrived that June, just in time for my ultrasound appointment. Out of all the people in my life I surprised with my pregnancy, I knew Tori's reaction would be memorable. We hadn't told either one the real reason for the visit, only that we were hosting an event one they wouldn't want to miss. When the twins and I emerged onto the front porch to greet them, I made sure to wear a form-fitting shirt. My hair had grown significantly during my pregnancy, and now grazed my lower back. As Caddy and Ava had told me numerous times, I was glowing radiating warmth and life with every smile and laugh I sent out into the world. Zane spotted me first, his slate grey eyes homing in on my stomach as if there were a flashing sign spelling out his name. His eyes were on my stomach long enough for Cade to growl under his breath. Zane chuckled and nodded his head towards Tori. Good luck getting her attention. She's searching for her heat protectant spray. Zane snorted. I didn't miss the way he eyed Tori's bottom as she rummaged through the car. You'd be a bit more understanding if it were your hair that turned into a frizzball in humid environments. She huffed, not glancing his way. She was fishing through the trunk, searching through her copious amounts of luggage when she turned to see what Zane was laughing at. Confusion filled her emerald eyes, as she turned and waved at the twins and me. As she turned back to the trunk, her back stiffened. There she goes. Zane nodded to himself, a smirk on his face as he watched Tori's jaw drop. No FG way. She shrieked off key, making her mate's smirk turn into a full blown grin. She pulled me in for a cinnamon scented hug squealing and jumping as a slew of emotions burst within her like crimson fireworks. If I hadn't been six months pregnant, my best friend would have knocked me off my feet. The real excitement came that Thursday, two days after Tori and Zane arrived. The five of us piled into the cozy hospital room in the same hospital Tori's parents worked in. Her dad was the one flitting in and out asking if I needed anything before he came in to do the ultrasound. The gel was cold, as it had been the first time, I had gotten an ultrasound. This time, my stomach was larger, a dome that blocked out my legs and part of my feet. I stifled a giggle as Cade caught my eye, smirking at my wriggling toes. Tori's dad worked the probe over the tight skin on my stomach, his eyes on the small monitor ahead. His hair had just a little more salt than pepper, fading just a tad more each year. Ah, yes all right, it's shifted position. He nodded to himself, typing a few notes into the computer. 
He took another look at the screen, and my insides clenched painfully at the confusion tinging his emotions. Torai noticed as well and walked around to view the screen with her dad. She was in her second year of medical school, her goal to become a prenatal doctor. While that didn't make her qualified, I trusted her and her dad's judgment. What what is that? She asked, and I struggled to take in a breath. The twins took a step towards me, both more tuned into my own emotions and needs than their own. Their eyes were dark pits of concern and helplessness, because this was one battle they couldn't fight their way out of. Realization replaced the confusion on Tori's face, lightening the fear in my heart when a wide grin formed on her face. Her dad let out a laugh, lifting his glasses to get a better look. When he met my eyes, I felt the life within my stomach kick. Congratulations Luna Claire, you're having twin boys. The announcement rippled throughout the country, passing through countless packs as tales of my mates and I passed through the mouths of others. Down in our own streets, music and laughter could be heard. The townspeople had been celebrating all week, keeping bars and restaurants open 24 hours as strangers danced on sidewalks and sang into the open night. Up until I finally gave birth, I hadn't truly grasped the fact that my life was once again changing. Who I was how I thought of myself, it was shifting again. I still felt the inexperienced, clumsy girl deep within my soul even though I had changed, morphing into the woman I am now. That woman was also changing, growing closer to becoming a mother with each passing hour. Childbirth was something we were briefly taught about as children, but young girls never truly knew what it encompassed until they were the ones crying out in pain, feeling life tear through them. Through the pain and the tears, the twins were there with me. The blood and gore never once fazed them, but the whimpers and cries that left my LPS brought them agony they could not end. Whispered words and gentle touches were all they could provide as they felt the echo of my pain wash over their senses. The names Dean and Sebastian were chosen by the twins, who gazed down at the onyx-haired babies with eyes blown wide, adoration stirring in their depths. A celebration was thrown at the capital of our pack just three months after the twins' birth. Their chubby limbs had grown, as did their cheeks and thick manies of dark hair. They were spitting images of their fathers, right down to the eyes. Garrett and Julian often liked to watch them, even though they consistently got the two mixed up. How they couldn't tell Sebastian's curls from Dean's curved smile was beyond me. I had thought the celebration pointless at the time, but it was a way to catch up with the other high table members, considering we had only two meetings in the past year alone. Things were finally settling down, smoothing out into an era of peace that I hoped would last at least a few decades. The party was held at the park in town, so that any and everyone could come celebrate. Multiple grills were erected, stereos blasting music into the crowd. Families laughed, and children danced and chased after one another. The happiness and joy in the air made my head light, and a genuine smile to my face. Brandon Fox and Alicia made an appearance, as did Jasper and his mate. High table member Isabella had found her mate last year, and currently wandered the gardens with him at her side. Isaiah and Mara arrived late, caught in the traffic as the townspeople celebrated on the streets. Sage was responsible for the blooming gardens that surrounded us, while her son and his mate manned two of the large grills. Music trickled in from all directions, followed by laughter and the scent of charred meats. I spotted Mara's golden hair through the crowd and was a bit surprised to see another head of golden hair. Sabine, you were able to come. I smiled warmly, relieved I had sent an invitation to her when I sent out Mara and Isaiah's. I knew the chances of her coming this far were slim, but happiness blossomed within me at the sight of her out. She's doing a lot better with going unfamiliar places. Mara grinned, clasping her sister's hand in her own. Isaiah's eyes twinkled, and Mara let out a heartwarming laugh. 
Could we see the babies? Isaiah asked, an eager grin spreading across his face. It's incredible that you had twins. Another set of ruling twins. Isaiah loves children. If it weren't for my iron willpower and birth control, we would have had ten by now. Mara snorted, and even Sabine cracked a smile. Alec came up on my left, and Kate on my right. A few seconds later, I could make out Tori's fiery hair moving through the crowd. In her arms was Dean, sleeping softly as she cooed and fussed over him. Tori took her role as the mother of God solemnly blessed the twins with endless love. In Kate's arms was Sebastian, identical yet slightly different than his brother. Tufts of onyx hair were messy on the baby's heads, their eyes closed, and fists clenched as they slept the afternoon away. Any time I looked at them, the most overwhelming sense of peace washed over me I was focused on Dean's feather-soft lashes, so I hadn't heard what Sabine uttered but whatever it was made Mara stiffen and move her head. Sabine, what did you just say? Sabine looked surprised, as though she had finally found what she was looking for. Is that what she's been going on about for months? Isaiah asked his eyes growing white as he looked down at Sebastian sleeping in his arms. What's wrong? I asked, refusing to feed into my worry until someone explained. I looked towards Sabine, whose eyes were on my twin sons. Did you have a vision about my children? Sort of. Sabine said softly, her eyes flickering between the lot of us. Sometimes my visions are like a scenario playing out. Other times I see broken images and clips. I've been having this dream for months now, but I couldn't figure out how the pieces fit. I think I understand now her eyes flickered from Sebastian to Dean when she spoke, your babies are fraternal, a father for each. According to Tori and her dad it was rare, incredibly rare, but not impossible. Heteropaternal superfecundation they had called it even though we had chosen not to get a DNA test. They were both fathers to a set of twins, and complicating things further would do us no good. None of us knew it at the time, but it was only the beginning. The beginning of a legacy, a family of alphas and lunas that were new to this world that came in pairs of two. A line that would span the decades and help propel us werewolves into the future. Epilogue the humid summer air, with its traces of fresh water and wild flowers, had always been my favorite. It was especially fragrant here, in the field of golden grass I often visited. Even as I sat on the thick quilt I had brought along, I longed for the feel of the grass beneath my feet. Rummaging through my bag, I pulled out a cherry almond croissant I had saved from my bakery. After all the years, it was still up and running. The new management was a feisty girl named Kiera, whose pastry experiments often turned out incredible. This place had once been secret, but as I watched the children laugh and play, I couldn't bring myself to regret sharing this place with them. A piece of the purest happiness I had ever experienced, countless memories full of it all of which were made here. There were six of them, three boys and three girls, darting through the grass with ear-splitting grins on their faces. Some were missing a few baby teeth, others were covered in dirt with scraped knees. The boys were rough and rambunctious, but the girls were easily able to keep up. I chuckled to myself as Rose tackled her younger brother, both disappearing within the tall grass. Nice try, sweet pea. I might be older than you but my senses are just as strong. I smirked at one of the youngest, Annie. Her eyes were a copy of my own as I looked up at her. The ocean blue was on the same side, though her brown was a tad lighter than my own. A mane of curly onyx hair sprouted from a ponytail on her head, slicked back by a bit of mud that had gotten on her face. Annie pouted, 